After eight months with no story video, it was time to make another. So this is the complete story of Saints Row, as well as the shutdown of Volition. Now let's begin. In 2006, we begin with the player walking the streets of Stillwater when they witness the Vice Kings and the West Side Rollers getting into a fight over street tagging. The Los Carnales... It's not the Los Carnales, it's just the Carnales. Los means... Sorry, Dex. The Carnales roll up and blast both rival gangs, but the driver gets shot and almost runs over the playa. The last Vice King attempts to shoot the playa, but is stopped by Troy Bradshaw and Julius Little, known associates of the Third Street Saints. Julius lets them know about a problem in the row. Come to the church when you want to be a part of the solution. The player visits the church, but is questioned about their presence. In order to prove themselves, they gotta be canonized. canonized. The player survives and is welcomed into the gang. After securing the row, Julius holds a meeting with the other Saints members. He assigns his lieutenants their respected gangs to get information out of them. Dex, you got the canales. Troy, you dealing with the Vice Kings. Not a chance. I'll take King out. Who's got the rollers? I do. Lynn? The f*** you wearing blue for? I asked Lynn to hook up with the rollers. Julius's plan is to take out the other gangs and be the only gang in power in the city. It's our time now. Let's get this started. The player helps Dex and Troy take out the Canales drug distribution. The Canales are getting more into the drug game with the Colombians and their leaders, the Lopez brothers, are afraid to show any kind of weakness to them. Hector Lopez attends a meeting with the Colombians where the player assassinates him and everyone there. The Canales enforcer, Victor, calls Angelo Lopez and informs him of his brother's death. Angelo sends Victor and Carnale enforcers to attack the Saints at the church, but the Saints ultimately win. The Colombians sent to look over the Carnales drug operations notices them showing weakness and decides to potentially eventually start business with the Saints after they successfully return the drugs that the police seized. Julius, Dex, and the player meet with Manuel and agree to work together. However, Angelo attempts to end them all. You'll die for what you did to my brother! I wonder if he means us or Manuel. But flees in his car. Dex, the player, and some Saints assault Angelo's house. When confronted, Angelo's gun jams, so he leads Dex and the player on a car chase. He's able to escape by jumping the lifting bridge. Later on, Dex picks up the player and they head for the airport. Angelo is planning to leave the city with his girl, but without her shoes. Angelo can hear Dex and the player racing through the airport gate and decides to take off without Luz. The player is able to shoot down the plane and finally wipe out the Carnales. Luz shows up tardy to the party with some funky out of style shoes. Actually, they're these seasons new. Bullsh that's last year's fall collection. <laughs> that's not true. She begs them for help but is scared off when getting on Dex's last nerve. You know what? I think Julius was right about you. Lynn meets up with the player and has them steal a shipment of cars for the rollers to fit them with some bombs. Those bombs are later put to use during a race with the rollers. If you're in the lead for the final stretch, they're gonna hit the NOS to blow past you. When they do, boom. Lynn then finds a way to get in deeper with the gang. The player is to tear up the rollers mechanic, Donnie's shop. And when it looks like it's the end for Donnie, Lynn will come in to save the day, but at the cost of her car door. This ends up working, and Lynn meets with the rollers leader, William Sharp and his nephew, Joseph Price. Mr. Sharp doesn't trust Lynn and gives her a hard time, but she proves strong and fit to run with his crew. The player ear hustles Lynn's future meetings with the three, and ends up stopping the rollers from hitting a convoy and destroys cars that they want to strip for parts. Sharp becomes increasingly suspicious of Lynn, and convinces Joseph of the same. The same four people knew about those jobs. If I didn't sell us out, and you didn't sell us out, who else is there? Donnie? Donnie may not like it when things get messy, but there's no way he'd turn on me. Which brings us to... Lynn. Bravo. Lynn is then kidnapped and forced to lead the player into a trap, which results in both of them getting thrown into the trunk of Lynn's car. Sharp then drives the car onto the edge of a dock and calls Donnie to show him the truth. Lynn? Donnie, listen to me! I swear to God! Sharp then shoots Lynn and the player before having Donnie help him push the car into the water. Donnie is too upset and leaves it to Sharp to do it himself. The player is able to free themselves and go after Sharp, but Lynn doesn't make it. Joseph then gets the rollers together for an assault on the row. We're burning Saints Row to the ground! Julius and the player are able to take out their vehicles and get close enough to Joseph's, but he takes a hard break and knocks the player out of their seat. The player later meets Joseph to settle the score, but he shows up with a Packer truck. The player chases him down and leaves him in the fiery wreckage on the freeway. That was a hell of an explosion. You okay, player? I got ran over by a mother truck. What do you think? Oh, quit being a bitch. Leaving the rollers with no leader, they slowly disband. The player later meets with Johnny Gat and Dex to discuss the Vice Kings and his male anatomy. You don't look like much. Then again, I don't look like I have an 8-inch 
So, I guess we're both full of surprises. Suddenly, Gad gets a call from his girlfriend Aisha, saying that someone kidnapped her sister. Gad thinks it's the Vice Kings and sends the player to follow the yellow sedan that was seen taking Aisha's sister. It proves true when VK members are seen putting her in the warehouse filled with other kidnapped girls. The player takes out the VKs and frees the girls. Aisha is a singer contracted with the Vice Kings record label who was once in the Third Street Saints. Now she wants to get out of her contract, so her and Gat come up with a plan to fake her death and do some property damage. Gat then has the player take over Prong Court, which is run by one of their lieutenants, Tanya. Tanya goes back to her boss, Benjamin King, and they decide to try to get the area back, but are unsuccessful. Gat and the player then prepare to lead an assault on the old abandoned police station, where the VKs hang out. Tanya is there as well, but once they catch up to her, her boyfriend Big Tony knocks down the player and has Gat drop his gun. Gat also drops an innuendo about Tanya and another lieutenant, Warren Williams, sleeping together, which upsets Tony. You packing anything else? Just some rubbers. I was hoping I could get some of William's sloppy seconds. Guess I hit a nerve. Gat can't keep his mouth shut and ends up getting shot in the leg, but returns the favor. This distraction helps the player jump out of the window and retreat back to the church. The player then disguises themselves as Tanya's limo driver and drives her back to Tony's house, where Gat is being held. The player knocks down Tanya and kills Big Tony, with Gat making sure the job is done. He then calls for some more saints to get some artillery out of Tony's basement. Gat and the player then cause havoc around the city disguised as Vice King members to fool the police and stop protecting the VKs. Tanya and Warren are getting tired of King not doing anything to stop the saints, so they stage a coup to take him out. What is this? I built, I watched, and now I'm acting. This gets back to Julius, who grew up with King, and has the player save him and bring him back to the church. Julius gives King an ultimatum. Well, you got a choice. You can keep your f pride and die right now, or you could be a man and walk away. King, Gat, and the player then head to Tanya's pet house to take out the rest of the VKs and her. I'm gonna skull f that bitch. Hope you don't mind hepatitis. What? King gives Tanya a word of advice. Oh, Tanya. Uh. Do yourself a favor and die with some dignity. Now that all three gangs were withered out, Julius calls the player and appoints them at his right hand. The player later gets a call from the chief of police, Monroe, telling them that he's had Julius arrested. To get him back, the Saints are to do a favor for Monroe. Kill off a mayoral candidate, Marshall Winslow. Dex and Gat are furious when they still don't let Julius go. They decide to assassinate Monroe while he attends Winslow's funeral. This leads to the new mayor, Alderman Hughes, to call the player and invite them to his yacht and work something out. On the yacht, Hughes talks of how the world works and salting the earth. He then reveals that the player is going to die there, but Hughes hears a beeping sound when suddenly an explosion goes off, destroying the yacht and everyone on board. Now if you'll excuse me, I have a party to- Five years later, the player wakes up from a coma in a prison hospital. While waking up, another inmate is rolled in on a gurney from a shanking. The inmate, named Carlos, knows about the player and wants to help him bust out of prison. They fight their way through police forces until they reach a boat and head towards Stillwater. Carlos lets the player know about some unfortunate news. Without anyone to lead him, the Saints fell apart. Once the Brotherhood Ronin and Samdi showed up, the few that were left dropped their flags before they got killed. The player changes their clothes and heads to a bar where they see a new story about Johnny Gat, despite a patron who thinks the 6 o'clock news is a real buzzkill. Hey Barry, turn this shit off! I was watching that. I guess you're not anymore, are you, bitch? Could you turn the TV back on? They head to the courthouse before Johnny can be sentenced to bust him out. Hey, you look different. You do something with your hair? Gad gives some information about what's been going on since they've been in their coma. Julius is missing. Ben King wrote an autobiography. Dex is a... You know, don't even get me started, Dex. Speaking of Troy, the player can visit the police station and hear wiretap conversations between Troy, Dex, and Julius. They get Dex's phone number and he asks them to meet him at the old church. How you doing, player? If you've gone through Troy's files, you know that Julius set you up. Julius shows up too, and they both find out they've been set up by Dex. They fight their way out of the church and into Julius's car until they reach the museum tourist attraction. With the Masako soldiers taken out, the player shoots Julius. They argue about what the Saints became after taking out the other gangs. The player also states that Julius shouldn't have come after them. With his last words, Julius gets shot in the head, ending him for good. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't have been in a goddamn coma. But I guess that makes us even... Not really. The player later visits Gat's house when they reunite with Aisha and try to figure out where they could set up their new hideout for the Saints. Gat and the player head to an old mission house where there's an underground church. The only thing to do is to evict the current tenants. They later both head out to find gang members and lieutenants to be canonized, canonized into the Saints. Afterwards, the player, now the boss, assigns their lieutenants which gangs to go after. Pierce, you're on the Ronin. Shandi, you got the sons of Samdi. It's gotta be them. F you say? Carlos, 
the Brotherhood. I'm on it. It's our time now. Let's get this started. Pierce comes up with an elaborate plan to steal money from the Ronin's casino, but Gat has a better idea. But what if we just start here, walk into the casino, and just shoot all the mother that are between us and the money. They bring it back to Aisha's house where they watch the news coverage of the robbery. The leader of the Ronin, Shogo Akuji, informs his father, Kazo Akuji, of his failures. Kazo is to fly into Stillwater soon and Shogo wants to be rid of the Saints before he arrives. Ronin are seen riding around the Saints turf, but Gad is able to catch one of them and bring him to his house. He lets slip that Kazo is to come soon and Gad gives some background to the boss. Kazuo Okuji is the father of Shogo Okuji. This guy's a f boogeyman. When I was in jail, I would listen to some of the Ronin talk about what this guy did in Japan. It's not pretty. Shogo is having a discussion with Altar associate Dane Vogel about the Saints. Shogo assures Vogel by contacting his right hand, Junichi, who is staking out Aisha's house. Later on, Junichi ties up Aisha in order to get the Ronin's money back. He assures her he'll let her go if she cooperates. Gat and the boss show up but suspect something isn't right. Aisha yells out to warn Johnny, which causes Junichi to decapitate her. Gat and the boss spring into battle against Junichi and the Ronin. Once the boss finishes off the Ronin, they tell Gat to get out of their way, but this only ends up distracting Gat. Which resulting in him getting a katana to the gut. He lands a final headache and blow to Junichi as he runs off. The boss is able to get Gat to the hospital and phone Pierce. Pierce finds out when Kazo is setting down in Stillwater. He and the boss head to the airport to welcome him to America. Unfortunately, he's nowhere to be found, so they head back to the safe house. Turns out that Junichi saw the boss make his way to the terminal, so he got Kazo out safely. Shogo is angered that Junichi is now following his father's orders instead of his, so he makes a call to the boss, ending the life of Junichi, mirroring an homage to Kill Bill. Afterwards, the boss visits Gat to let him know that they got him. The Ronin also show up to visit Gat, but to take him out. The boss pushes Gat on a gurney, taking out Ronin until they reach the roof where they take a helicopter back to the Saints hideout. Gat then has a funeral for Aisha, but it's interrupted when Shogo shows up. Gat would rather respect Aisha and end Shogo another day, but his hand is forced. How noble. Nobility is sorely overrated. Gat knocks around Shogo before burying him alive. Back at the hideout, Pierce brings an old friend to the boss. Mr. Wong. This guy used to have me running around killing guys in hot dog suits. Unfortunately, Pierce was followed. Ronin and Kazo show up to take them all out, but he ends up speeding off on a motorcycle. Gat is to later protect Wong at the Heritage Festival, but it's crashed by Ronin and Kazo again. The boss shows up to help Wong and finally put an end to the Ronin's reign. Your son never should have with my friends. Shani gives the boss something to take the edge off, the Sons of Samdi's number one product. They call it Loa Dust. She figures the boss can steal some of it, break down however it's made, and sell it for cheaper. However, they can't figure out how it's made, so the boss busts out an old friend from prison who knows how. Later on, she gives the recipe to Shandi while her and the boss discuss how to stop the Sons from producing anymore, leading Shani to a revelation. In college, I dated this guy who would sell for the Sons, and he mentioned that they used to grow all their s*** on the farm off campus. Laura's boyfriend, Tobias, flies the boss over the farm to set it ablaze. Elsewhere, the general and his right-hand man, Mr. Sunshine, threaten a popular DJ, veteran child, since he is their bagman and need answers how the saints would know about the crop. They then task him to find and end Shandi. If you fail to do this, Mr. Sunshine will burn you alive. Does this sound fair? Uh, excellent. Veteran Child knocks out and kidnaps Shandi, which the boss witnesses and hunts him down to save her. Shandi later calls the boss to a frat party where one of her exes gives some information on some Samdi drug labs for the boss to destroy. The general is growing tired and has the boss drugged and taken hostage in his limo to take out the thorn in his side. Even though the boss is high as a kite, they still manage to escape, get back to the hideout, and take out the Samdi. The saints are able to destroy and steal more of the Samdi shipments. When Sunshine tries to have some addicts steal back the shipment, the boss injures one of them and forces them to reveal where he's at. The boss infiltrates the meatpacking plant and takes out Sunshine, albeit with a flurry of bullets and a decapitation. The boss doesn't know how they can get to the general, so them and Shandi storm the police station to steal some surveillance equipment so they can find his limo. Once found, they set up an elaborate ambush to destroy it. He runs into the nearby mall with the boss and Shandi close behind. They take out the general's gun-mounted truck and celebrate with the smoke and a compliment to Shandi. Veteran child? Seeing as he's dead, I'm pretty sure you'd kick his ass. The boss and Carlos visit the Brotherhood's leader, Mero. He has a shipment coming through soon, and rather than the Saints and Brotherhood go at war for it, he wants to give them a cut. During this meeting, guards and police show up to stop them, but they manage to get back to the Brotherhood's hangout. The boss also notices a familiar face, Donnie. But back to business. Mero offers 20% to the Saints, which the boss takes as an insult. After some back and forth, the boss leaves, hinting that they're strong enough to take on the Brotherhood. Honey, you want me to have someone take care of them? No. They'll be dead soon enough. 
The boss later kidnaps Donnie and forces him to blow up his new cruise vehicles. Mero takes out his anger on Donnie but is stalked by his girlfriend Jessica. The boss questions Carlos on some information he's dug up about the Brotherhood but comes up empty. The boss is upset but knows a way to toy with Mero by gifting him with some new radioactive tattoo ink. Baby? The boss is to meet up with Carlos again, but when he doesn't show up, they get a call from Jessica. Since you were nice enough to give my man a makeover, I should return the favor. Don't worry, by the time we're through with him, Carlos will look just as handsome as Mara. When you're scraping up your buddy's face, just remember, Mero gave you a chance to be his partner. The boss chases down and stops the truck dragging Carlos. Then they try to help him, but know that this is the end for Carlos Mendoza. Shandi is playing some hacky sack with some friends when she almost gets run over by Jessica. She's carrying a briefcase full of cash into a bank, prompting Shandi to call the boss. They kidnap her, stuff her in the trunk of her car, and leave it in a monster truck rally that Mero attends. He's unaware of what's happened and unknowingly crushes his girlfriend. When you check the trunk, just remember you should offer me something better than 20%. The boss is still trying to figure out what and when the shipment is coming. Shani suggests interrogating the tattoo artist who's playing at a rock show in his band, The Feed Dogs. They beat it out of Matt and give him an early retirement. They then call Shandi to follow up on the info at the docks. Meanwhile, Mero goes to Dane Vogel to try to have him help the Brotherhood go after the Saints. Vogel isn't convinced, but Mero refreshes his head. Vogel gives a call to new Chief of Police and former undercover Saint, Troy Bradshaw. Vogel wants Troy to release the Brotherhood members currently locked up to please Mero. This is covered in a news report which the boss sees. They track down the prison buses and take out the gang members on board. Mero goes back to Vogel to threaten to help him again, but Vogel has other ideas. Your problem is that there's a group of security guards with assault rifles pointed at your back. Back. He also informs Mero that Altar have taken over the boat carrying his shipment as payment. Shani gets back to the boss with some info on the boat, so they head for it and take out the Altar guards on board. While in the hull, they get a call from Shani telling them that a lot of Brotherhood are on their way to take back control of the boat. The boss takes them out and has some more Saints come on board to take their artillery back to shore. Now armed to the teeth with Mero's guns, the Saints infiltrate the Brotherhood's hangout, taking out multiple members until the boss gets to Mero. He's armed with a minigun, but it stood no chance against the boss. Down to his last resort, Mero throws the minigun at the boss and battles him in fisticuffs, all while falling through the ceiling to the tattoo room. The boss starts to get the upper hand but is tackled by Matt, causing Mero to escape in a truck. The boss later gets a call from Mero to meet him and finish it. As they enter the Altar Dome, it becomes evident that the boss is overpowered. They destroy the other vehicles and Mero's. Laying in a pile of parts, Mero says his last words before the boss ends him with a bullet to the head. Go to hell. Sorry. Didn't catch that. Now the Saints are their only gang in Stillwater, but back at the Altar building, Vogel is having a meeting with the shareholders on how Altar can eradicate the Saints and take hold of the town, gang free. By directing the gangs towards Sunnyvale, the gangs cripple each other. We direct funds to the Stillwater Police Department, they increase police presence, crime stops, property value goes up, and now your population looks like this. The boss heads to a local bar but are unaware that Altar are closing in on them. They make their way out and save Pierce and Shandi from Altar guards. They find out the guards work in a place called the Pyramid, which they have Shandi check out. She reports back it's a secret R&D facility. The boss and Gat storm this facility and bomb the place, causing it to be exposed to the public. Altar's board of directors threaten Vogel to put a lid on the Saints. The boss later gets an invitation to a fundraising party on a boat with the other directors. The boss heads there and takes them all out, with Vogel watching the destruction from his office, smirking since he's now the head of Altor. He holds a press conference where the boss and Gat plan to assassinate him. However, Gat is found out and lets out a shot, causing Havoc and Vogel to be rushed off the stage. Gat clears a path for the boss but doesn't get to Vogel in time. They then take an attack chopper and shoot out the window to Vogel's office. Vogel pleads with the boss, trying to be optimistic and a fanboy. You're alive! They're dead and you have the Saints' number one fan running all- But this just gets him shot in the face and plummets to the ground floor. Pierce and Shandi then show up tardy to the party. The boss calls for their ride out and see Gat in the streets still fighting cops. As they ride off in the sunset, the boss knows that the Saints are now in control of all of Stillwater. This is our city. We do whatever the f we want. Now in 2014, the Saints drop the guns and pick up rubbery purple veiny baseball bats. We see them getting ready to rob a bank. You're robbing a bank dressed like yourselves. Hell yeah. 
Who doesn't want to be Johnny Gat? Everything seems to be going well, but suddenly the tellers fight back. The gang fight their way up to the vault to plant a bomb to blow it loose. They then reach the floor right above it and detonate it. Josh thinks he's calling in the helicopter for an extraction, but it's actually the alarm for the bank. He runs and leaves the three saints to fight oncoming cops. The chopper flies in, the boss hooks up the vault, and they get out. Unfortunately, an enemy helicopter ends up crashing into the saints chopper, causing it to plummet to the streets. The boss is able to jump back into the bank and right into the cops hands. Well, sh now in their jail cell, the Saints talk about what they've become and how much of a serious gang they used to be. Just then, twin sisters, Viola Akiki de Winter, kidnap the Saints and take them to their employer on a plane. Turns out the bank was owned by Philippe Loren, head of the Morning Star. He tries to offer amnesty to the Saints if they agree to pay up some of their revenue to the Syndicate, an organization made up of three gangs, the Morning Star, Luchadors, and the Deckers. The Saints refuse and recommend Loren to make some breakfast. Please, I am Belgium. So make yourself a f***ing waffle. We done here. But instead he orders for them to be killed. Gat is able to break out of his chair and attack Loren, but is stabbed in the gut. He smashes Loren's head into the window, causing him to run off. Shandi and the boss fight to the end of the plane while Gat fends off the Morning Star. Once they reach the end, Shandi calls out to Gat. Johnny, we're about to jump! <laughs> Johnny. The boss and Shandi then fly out of the plane and make it to Steelport. Loren has a meeting with his other associates. Steelport belongs to the syndicate and the saints are not welcome. Mr. Kilbane, gather your luchadores and bring me their leader's head. Mr. Miller, hack into the saints' accounts and leave them nothing. Now broke, the boss and Shani decide to rob a military base to get some guns for the Saints coming to Stillport. They also lift a bomb to be put to use later. Pierce finds a penthouse to use as a base for the Saints. Only thing is that it's owned by the Morning Star. The boss flies in and lets the other Saints in to overtake their new place. Once they've caused more mayhem for the Morning Star, the Saints infiltrate the big ass skyscraper that Loren is hiding in. On the way up, they come across a big brute hung up by wires. Oleg is used by Loren to create clones, but what they lack is his brains. The Saints cut him loose and bring him along to find Loren. He ends up taking an express elevator, but the boss takes a bigger and quicker ride down. The ball ends up crushing Loren and rolls around the city. The boss can either use the bomb from the military base to blow up the skyscraper or disarm it and keep the building for the saints. Either way, they gang Oleg as a new homie. You'd prefer a more manly shade, like purple? The saints then attend a bridge opening in honor of Alderman Hughes. Presenting the bridge is his wife, Monica. Luchadors crash the ceremony and try to gun down the saints. Up in some buildings, the Luchadors and their leader and wrestler, Kilbane, fire some rockets at them. The Saints end up getting knocked into the ocean. They've had enough of the Syndicate and are ready to go after them. Oleg has them recruit some more people who also despise the Syndicate as much as they do. The boss saves former FBI agent Kinsey Kensington from the Deckers, rescues Pimp Zemos from the De Winter Sisters, and protects wrestler Angel De La Muerte from the Luchadors. Afterwards, the boss and Kilbane hold a meeting with their respected members. It's our time now. Let's get this started. The boss later gets a call from Shandi, stating that she's upset there's a party going on at the Saints headquarters. When they get there, Pierce and Zemos try to convince her that this is to celebrate the Saints coming into Steelport, but she still is set about Gat's death. Later on that night, a dancer tries to shoot Pierce, but the boss stops her. All the dancers are packing and try to take out the Saints, but they stand their ground. The dancers were actually sent by the De Winter sisters, which Kilbane is upset about. Kiki stands up for her and her sister, but this upsets Kilbane and snaps her neck. Viola calls the boss and gives them some information on a boat carrying more dancers for the more Morning Star. The boss saves them and could give them back to the syndicate or keep them as homies for the Saints. Viola calls the boss again to meet with them to join up to get back at Kilbane. Just then, the Special Tactical Anti-Gang Unit, or STAG, show up to take out the boss and Viola. With Oleg's help, they're able to take out some of the soldiers and escape back to Saints HQ. STAG's leader, Cyrus Temple, states that STAG is here to stay in Steelport until the gangs are eradicated. The boss has Pierce and Oleg clear out the Saints building since STAG is onto them, while they go and knock down some of the soldiers. The boss then witnesses Kilbane on Jane Valdez. Rama's talk show, blaming the Saints for the destruction of Alderman Hughes's memorial bridge. Shandi and the boss try to go after him, but somehow their helicopter crashes and Kilbane escapes. Kinsey later has the boss and Pierce at her warehouse to discuss going after the Deckers. In order to get their leader, Matt Miller, they need to do it virtually. She has them gather all the equipment to build a what looks like a futuristic gaming setup so the boss can go in and confront Matt. The boss and him face off with their avatars and eventually Matt meets his demise. He does offer a deal to them to let them go freely, dismantling the Deckers. Can you tell me the name of a company and it becomes the property of the saints you get your empire back 
and I get to walk away. At the same time, the boss and Viola kidnap Josh Burke to draw out Stag. Once they come face to face with Cyrus, they can give Josh back or keep him as a homie. Either choice results in Stag opening fire on the Saints building and Cyrus ordering his right hand Kia to return the favor and kidnap Shadney. She does, but the boss comes up with a plan to rescue her. I walk in with my prisoners, they take me to the cell block, I grab Shandi and we leave. You and Pierce, <laughs> I'm bringing you in. Oh hell no! Showtime. On the boat, the boss gets close enough to Kia to find out where Shandi, Pierce, and Viola are to free them. Before the Saints leave, they plant bombs on the ship to sink it. Twelve hours later, Stag gets the okay to lock down the city to take down the Saints. The Saints then meet to discuss taking out Kilbane. Viola suggests to humiliate Kilbane in the upcoming Mortar Brawl wrestling event. The boss and Angel go around the city, taking out the other contenders. So that way Kilbane is forced to go one-on-one -on -one with the boss. The boss also wants Angel to be the one to fight Kilbane, but has to do it without Kilbane knowing. In order for him to fight, Angel must reclaim his mask from Kilbane's casino. At Murder Brawl, the boss gets called out to face Kilbane, but surprises him with Angel. The boss keeps Kilbane's luchadors off of Angel as they fight. Suddenly, Kilbane throws Angel out of the ring, injuring his leg. The boss takes over for Angel and gets Kilbane in a headlock. The boss can take off or leave Kilbane's mask. Either way, he's humiliated and runs out of the arena. He takes out his anger on his luchadors when he gets an idea. This is my city. I am its Caesar! And I get to fiddle while it burns. The next day, the Luchadors are going at war with Stag in the streets. The Saints level out the playing field when the bus gets a call from Angel and Kia. He's at the airport. There isn't much time. I can't let him win. We can't let him win. Once you blow up the Magarak Island, the whole world will see your true colors. We'll see how many people believe that when Shandi and Viola are found in the wreckage. If the boss meets with Angel, they ride in his car while shooting rockets at Kilbane's plane. After its destruction, Kilbane emerges from the rubble and faces off one more time with the boss. They snap his neck and sit on the ground, while off in the distance, they can hear the sound of the Maverick statue blowing up. Pierce then gives the boss a call. Kill that son of a bitch? Yeah. Was it worth it? The Saints meet to honor Shandi and Viola when suddenly Stag unveils their warlike aircraft and starts shooting down any buildings that the Saints might be in. The boss infiltrates the Daedalus to plant some bombs and take out Cyrus Temple. They then fly off to a broadcast news station while the aircraft is destroyed. At the news station, the boss sends a message to Monica Hughes and declares Steelport to be its own country. Dear bitch, Steelport is under new management and we don't answer to you. This is foreign soil now. Come at my city again and you'll go home in a box. Back to you. If the boss goes to save Shandi and Viola, which is the canon ending, they head to the island and knock out all the bombs into the ocean. With the final standoff between them and Kia, the Saints are praised as heroes, leaving a sour Saints flow taste in Cyrus's mouth. We then see the boss and the other Saints members on Mars, heading for a fight with Kilbane. The members are picked off one by one, leaving only the boss to face Kilbane, where Star Wars Shocker is revealed. I am your father. The boss gives a final monologue, but flusters their words. Turns out this is the set for the new movie, Gangsters in Space. All right, people, big smiles. It's a happy ending. And action. About five years later, the Saints are now helping MI6 agent Asha Odakar with taking out a terrorist operation led by Cyrus Temple. You're a real people person, aren't you? I'm sorry, is this a counter-terrorist operation or a Saints flow shoot? I'm shy. Asha Odakar. Follow me. After Steelport, the US removed Cyrus from his position, which led him to take revenge on them. The Saints, Asha, and her tech handler, Matt Miller, infiltrate the base to find and take out Cyrus. The boss ends up chasing him and fights on the ground for their gun. The boss gets a hold of it and shoots Cyrus in the head, causing him to fall in some acid, but not before detonating a nuke. The boss jumps onto and dismantles it, which causes it to explode in the sky. They then land in the Oval Office and make themselves comfortable. Since they saved Washington, they run for President of the United States and win. Another five years later, the President made some changes of the law as you can see during the cutscene. They're headed for a press conference when they get stopped by Shandi. She tells them that MI6 as well as Kinsey are making reports of aliens heading for Earth. They think we're about to be attacked by aliens. I gotta go. The president doesn't believe it, but says they'll talk to Asha after the conference. Just then, aliens invade the White House and abduct Kinsey and Shandi. The president makes their way to the Oval Office, all while Saints members are being abducted. Please save yourself! They take out aliens and notice the chaos outside and call for the big guns. Bird to Ernie, Bird to Ernie. Activate South Portico defenses. They shoot down spaceships and eventually Zinyak's battleship. The president crashes through the glass for a 1v1 with Zinyak, but they are sorely defeated. They wake up in a squeaky clean 50s era steel port. They soon realize it's not real. What the f 
we don't use that kind of language here in Steelport. But are able to escape with Kinsey's help. But before they escape, Zaniac threatens that if they try to defy him, he'll destroy Earth. The president wakes up for real this time on Zaniac's mothership. Kinsey and Keith David rescue the boss and make their way back to Earth. They try to get in touch with Oleg, but the caller gets sent to voicemail. Then devastation begins. It's all gone. You killed seven billion people. Whoops. The three figure that have breaking out the boss did some damage to the simulation, then causing more chaos which shut the whole thing down. The boss goes back in and starts causing mayhem and taking out Zinn. Along the way, Kinsey finds other simulations where fellow Saints members are. Each simulation is crafted after whatever that prisoner fears. So in a way, the boss fears no warfare or cursing, which is why they woke up in that simulation. The boss also meets an AI in the simulation who will help them get the other simulations if they find him a physical body. Once they do, they rescue the other Saints members from their fears, which are Matt Miller fearing Kilbane and finally standing up to him. Pierce fears corrupting marketing and takes out Paul the Saints Flow Mega Boss. Benjamin King relives the coup that the VKs pulled on him and takes out Tanya again. Asha fears not being able to save Matt from an evil version of the boss that eventually takes him out. But wait, Kinsey finds a simulation involving a plane. She thinks it's Shandy's but the boss is adamant that Johnny Gad is still alive. When they get to the simulation, they face Morningstar and head to the cockpit where they see Shandy mourning over a dead Johnny. This is her simulation, not being able to save him and blaming herself. Xenia gets involved and sends Shandy to a recreation of when Veteran Child took her hostage. The boss defeats him again and they head back to the ship. Later on, the simulation gets flooded with members of the Vice Kings and the Ronin. The team believes this fits the profile of Johnny Gat. The boss heads back to the ship where Kinsey tracks down Gat's simulation, but she does have concerns. In order to save Johnny, we have to tap directly from our ship into his mind, and that means Zinyan's going to know exactly where we are. The boss is ready to save Johnny and bring him back. They enter a side scroller beat him up where Johnny's nightmare is not being able to save Aisha from the VKs and Ronin. In the end, he is able to save her, but knows he must depart. Since this isn't real. But the reunion was soon over, as the street tough remembered the tragedy that claimed his love so many years ago. Thanks for playing. The boss wakes up back on the ship and gets into the power armor robot to get onto Zignac's ship and get Johnny. Announcements are overheard, sounding like Johnny is causing his own mayhem to escape. The boss then reaches Gat and takes him back to the ship, as he recalls what really happened on the plane. So I'm in the plane doing my thing. your reputation doesn't do you justice. The Saints enter the simulation to finally be rid of the Zin, but Zinyak sends the Zin to attack the Saints. They fight as much as they can, but Zinyak ends up kidnapping Kinsey. The boss, Gat, and Shani come out of the simulation to find the Zin are attacking their ship. Too bad for them we're awake. The boss dismantles the bombs that the Zin placed and plants them on their ship. As the other Saints come out of the simulation, the boss figures out that Keith David is working with Zinyak. Keith David is a dead man. The boss goes to a rally in the simulation where Keith is recruiting the public to join Zinyak in taking out the boss with promises that the earth will be rebuilt. The boss fights off the crowd and gets to Keith, but when he sees the boss close to death from the Zin, he helps them out. Zinyak is disappointed and sends the boss and Keith to his own simulation nightmare. Keith has a fight with Rowdy Roddy Piper and ends up joining the boss to snapping Keith out of his mind. Keith tells the boss where Kinsey is, the squeaky clean 50 simulation that the boss was in before. Kinsey is wearing a poodle skirt and has Cyrus Temple as the mayor. The boss ends Cyrus with the power of dubstep and brings Kinsey back to the ship. Just saying, it was a cute poodle skirt. Kinsey then needs the boss to find parts to build a key. This key will be, well, the key to shutting down the simulation. It's our time now. Let's get this shit. Once they have made it, they go to a power source for the key. As it gets inserted, the simulation disrupts. The boss then takes Saints members to open portals where homies will be sent in to fight the Zin. Once all the portals are open, the simulation starts to shut down. The Saints are then able to find Zinyak's mothership. The boss infiltrates it and along the way, finds power armor. They fly through the ship until they breach a vent into Zinyak's throne room. After exchanging words, Well, at least you're honest. Always. That way you know I'm not lying when I say I'm gonna rip your goddamn head off. You're adorable. The boss and Zinyak engage in a power armored fight. Eventually, the boss makes good on the promise and rips off Zinyak's head. The Zin praise them as their new leader. And so the Saints Empire was born. Following the events of Saints Row 4, the Saints members throw a party to celebrate Kinsey's birthday. They have games such as Pin the Tail on the Donkey and Conjuring a Demon. Wait, hold up. So you celebrate birthdays by trafficking with spirits? It's spooky and fun. Yep, that's right. Some of them play with the Ouija board and ask it if the president will ever get married, which the cursor points to yes. But when they ask who, it spells out Jezebel. Jezebel? 
Who the f and suddenly a portal opens up, sucking the president in. Matt reveals he got the board from Zinyak's artifacts. The board laughs at them, but Johnny does his own form of interrogation to find out where the president has gone. Another portal opens up and sucks Gat and Kinsey into hell, taking them to Dane Vogel's new altar office he created there. Welcome to hell. Gat thinks he's responsible for the president's kidnapping, but Vogel explains what happened. The president had caused more chaos and destruction than any other in human history. It was only natural that Satan would want them to marry his daughter. Gad has a plan, but he needs to get an invitation to the wedding. To do that, he needs to destroy places that are held dear to Jezebel and Satan, which will get their attention and want him to meet Johnny personally. Johnny also recruits some other people who can help him dethrone Satan, who are the De Winter sisters, Vlad the Impaler, Blackbeard the Pirate, and William Shakespeare. Satan was taking notice of Gat waging war, but he was having problems of his own. I don't love them! You think I care? If you started acting like a father, you would. I'm looking after your best interest. You don't care about my happiness! This is about you! If you just stop telling- You will marry that saint! Jezebel sets out to find Gat so she can be free from her father. Gat meets her and they team up to sneak him into the palace. I'll offer you a deal, Mr. Gat. Marry my daughter and I'll allow your companion to leave with the president's soul. It's your choice. Gat makes good on his promise, but it doesn't do much. Gat then fight off Satan's minions. They both battle each other, but Gat delivers the final blow, defeating Satan. As the president, Kinsey, and Jezebel return to the ship, God keeps Gat behind. He thanks him for what he's done in saving heaven from Satan's wrath and gives him a choice of his reward. He can choose to stay in heaven and reunite with Aisha. Aish. Become the new leader of hell. Do you miss your friends? Nah. I know they'll be down here in no time. Have the saints find a new world for the remains of humanity? It appears to be inhabited by a psychotic warlike race. This is going to be our toughest fight yet. Thank you, God. Have God recreate the world, but doing so will restart the history of Saints Row? When the lieutenant gets to interrogation, Brimstone's gonna talk. Or be given the knowledge of the answers to all questions of the universe. Oh. Supposedly, the true canon ending is Johnny choosing God to recreate Earth and restarting Saints Row. Doing this brings up to Angels of Mayhem, but I don't see that as a Saints Row title, even though there are plenty of Saints Row references. I do believe this ending is true, but this leads us to a different Saints Row title, starting in 2022. The player is starting their new job at Marshall Defense Industries, MDI, which was founded by Atticus Marshall, and their goal is to make the world a safer and better place, kind of like Ultor. We make the world a better place. Old Tour, a brighter future and a better life. Anyways, right now the player and a Marshall team are on their way to find the Nuwali, the leader of a small gang who is to expand his criminal empire. Marshall faces off against the Nuwali's crew and the player is able to come face to face with him. He tries to escape but the player uses some unorthodox techniques to capture him. The player heads back to Marshall HQ, showers up and prepares to head home. Before they leave, their superior Gwen hands them with a performance bonus, nothing but an empty envelope. This serves as a warning to the player to listen to protocol and fall in line or else they'll be fired. A frustrated player drives the morning commute home while ranting to themselves. At home, the roommates Kevin, Nina, Eli, and Snickerdoodle are cooking breakfast. The player informs them about how their first f***ing day went. This lady walked right off the set of an 80s action movie. I was half expecting her to call me Rook and threaten to take my badge. And are now worried they won't be able to make rent this month. They do what they do best, rob the payday loan place. Walk away or the phrase dead end job gets literal. The player escapes to a switch car, but it's mistreated by the Los Panteros. It's not the Los Jesus, what's wrong with you? Okay, okay, sorry Dex, I forgot. The player takes out the Panteros and escapes on a dirt bike. They dodge the police and end up stuck on a bridge, surrounded by cop cars. Nina stun jumps in to save the player, where we are welcomed to the exciting new city of Santo Eliso. The player gets called by Gwen to observe an operation from Los Panteros. All they have to do is follow them and report back to Gwen where they go. But the player still doesn't know how to follow the rules and goes after the truck with their driver JR. They hop aboard and make it crash into a ditch. Martial operatives show up to recover the stolen goods. The player meets Atticus, who congratulates them for recovering the Hummingbird Codex, an important relic. He also offers them a promotion. The player accepts, much to Gwen's dismay. Atticus throws a special event at the museum to display the Codex. Nina calls the player to warn them that she is driving the Panteros there so they can steal the Codex. Panteros storm the museum, as well as the idols. Wealthy parasites of Santo Eliso. We are the idols. Fear us! The player must escort the Codex to safety, but gets sidetracked when Maya Starr, a member of the board of directors, needs help getting out. Once the bullets stop flying, Atticus is angered with the player when he reveals the Codex they have is a fake. While the player was distracted with Myra, the idols manage to swap the Codex with the replica. Atticus tells off Myra and fires the player. Sir, I can lead a team to retrieve the Codex. The hell you can. You're fired. 
What? The next day, the player is in a funk and forces themselves out of bed. They sit down on the couch and watch knife infomercials with Nina. Nina is also in a funk when Sergio, the Pantera's leader, is angered he couldn't get the codex. After some hours go by, she gets a text from him stating that the Panteros are going to hit the idol's party. Everyone at that party's probably gonna get killed. Sucks to be Kevin Eli. Yeah. Oh sh gotta go. At the party, the Panteros start shooting it up. Eli gets hit while taking cover behind the bar. Kevin jumps off the stage and attends to him. The player and Nina take out the Panteros and help Eli, but the idols are angered with Kevin for protecting his friends and must make a choice. He chooses friendship and they fight their way back to the apartment. While patching up Eli, the player points out the obvious despite the others not seeing it. Isn't that obvious? We're starting a criminal empire. But with a short speech, the three of them, even Snickerdoodle, agree to start their own gang. It's our time now. Let's get this started. They start by acquiring the deed to an old abandoned church as a base. This is also where they find their logo and a name to call the gang. The Saints. We call ourselves the Saints. To find recruits, the boss competes in a live stream fight club called Boot Hill. Afterwards, they plan to rob a train. They do this because, well, criminals aren't going to provide their services for nothing. The boss points out it'll be a tough job, so they decide to bust the Nuali out of martial custody and bring him along to help. When they free him, the Nuali and the Saints have doubts about each other, so they decide to have a fun day of team building to gain each other's trust, members caps included. The day of the train robbery comes, and it seems to be going as smooth as it can be until the Panteros storm the train. Even Sergio jumps out of the helicopter to fight the boss, but the Nuali cuts in, literally, and saves them. Bad news, the train crashes and everything is destroyed. The good news, the Saints are able to bring home stacks of cash and bricks of gold. They celebrate with a money fight until Eli kills the buzz. To get the word out that the Saints aren't f***ing around, they decide to steal the Hummingbird Codex from the idols. This proves successful and now the Saints made a name for themselves and it's time to celebrate. Before they can though, the boss gets served. You see, when they signed the agreement when they got hired by Marshall, they agreed to the non-compete clause, but this was violated when they attacked the Frontier Prison, the Marshall Train, and other assets. So they became a competitor. You have surrendered all rights and ownership of the Saints to us. The boss decides to attack Marshall's tower to Aunt Atticus, but he fled before the boss showed up. Myra Starr gives the boss a proposal, however. If you make Atticus look bad enough, our company's stock price will tank, shareholders will panic, and the board will have no choice but to change leadership. That's when I'll take over and give the Saints back to you. When the board has their meeting, the final member has the last say so, you. Afterwards, Myra sticks to her word and gives the Saints ownership back to the boss. Now it's time to party. The boss's friends head inside while they hang back and chat with the Nuali. He compliments the friendship that they have with, oh my god! The Nuali betrays them and buries them alive. This is for the best. Uh, do not worry. I'll keep our friends safe. On the brink of death, the boss starts tripping and envisions their favorite board game, but finally comes back and digs their way out of the grave. The party is crashed and the boss's friends are kidnapped by the Nuali and forced to reenact the first scene we saw the four best friends in, but with Kevin wearing a shirt this time. The boss attacks the Nuali's old hangout to find out where he's hiding out. They're about to end the last gang member, but he surprisingly gives up his location without hesitation. The boss attacks the building as it goes into lockdown. They manage to get to their friends, but the Nuali gets the upper hand, but then Snickerdoodle saves the day. The other saints land some blows too, even Kevin sacrifices his new waffle iron. The Nuali tries to escape and attack them with his helicopter, but they're able to damage it enough for him to jump out. The boss and the Nuali have a classic Red Dead Redemption standoff, but the boss is able to draw quicker and injure him before landing the final shot to the head. The crew set out the lawn chairs, drink up their mug mosas, and are ready for the challenges they'll face in the future. The Saints have only been around for like a minute, and we've already gained and defeated a nemesis. Not a bad start. No. <laughs> Not bad at all. Unfortunately, what their future entailed was inevitable. Volition, the company that helped develop the Saints Row series, as well as many others, shut down after 30 years on September 1st, 2023. This was due to their parent company's Embracer Group new restructuring program. This was to maintain its position as the leader of the video game industry. So to achieve this, they evaluated strategic and operational goals, which was to shut down Volition immediately. Volition helped give us great titles like the Red Faction and Descent series, but nothing as iconic as Saints Row. As of right now, no Saints Row title is to be seen anytime soon, but according to Game Rant, this doesn't mean it's the end just yet. There might be some candidates to take Volition's place. The link to the full article will be in the description. But for now, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.